Hello, this video is about activities and the systematic treatment of equilibria. So one of the things you have to understand in order to understand activities is the fact that ions in solution are hydrated. Um, so if they're in water, they're surrounded by an organized sheath of water molecules. What that means is that the hydrated radius is going to be bigger than the ionic radius. So if you look at this plot on the right hand side, what you'll notice is that the core of the ion, which is the dark blue here, right, so there's your core, is much smaller than the hydrated radius. Um, and this thing that you're going to learn about being called activity is related to the size of this hydrated radius. And what happens is that the smaller, highly charged ions have bigger hydrated radius. So how did we come to know about activity? First, let's talk about the effect that ionic strength has on how soluble salts are. So in the past, we've studied equilibrium constant, KSP, and that kind of thing. And in this example, it's not a KSP, but what we have is this equilibrium reaction between iron 3 plus, which is a pale yellow, thiocyanate, which is colorless, and iron thiocyanate, which is red. And what is seen here is that if you do a, an analysis of basically the equilibrium constant, so here you have the equilibrium constant, and you plot that equilibrium constant on the y-axis, and you do it compared to how much of this inert salt, non-reactive salt, potassium nitrate, is present. What you see is that it's shifting the equilibrium. So you have less of the product ferrocyanide um, as you increase the amount of salt. And so that doesn't make any sense at first glance because neither the K plus, potassium plus, or nitrate minus from the potassium nitrate are actually part of this equilibrium reaction. So it's not a Le Chatelier principle effect. So in that case, what could it be, right? Um, so what could it be? <laughs> Here's another example. Um, these sparingly soluble salts with KSP, right? So calcium sulfate only dissolves a little bit. It's got a pretty low KSP, 2.4 times 10 to the minus 5. And what will happen is that more of this calcium sulfate is going to dissolve when the inert salt of potassium nitrate is added. And in general, adding inert salts increases the solubility of sparingly soluble salts like calcium sulfate. So why? Well, it's not a reaction, um, but what happens is that this ionic strength by having the second salt increases. And that matters because there are interactions between ions, they're charged species in the solution. So to explain this, you want to think about an ionic compound in solution, in aqueous solution, and that it has what's called an ionic atmosphere. So in the plot here, you have the centralized cation or anion, and then if it's a cation, like the calcium 2 plus from calcium sulfate, then it's going to be, because of its positive charge, it's going to be attractive to the negative ions like the nitrate and sulfate. And so they're going to partially offset that charge. And so you see here this partial negative charge surrounding the cation. Um, same thing happens for anions, so like the sulfate. So right here, if we're talking about calcium sulfate, this is the SO4. 2 minus for the anion and calcium 2 plus is your cation. Now the anion, the sulfate here, um, is going to end up with um, this partial offset of the calcium 2 plus and of potassium plus um, that is offsetting its charge. So that's an interesting thing. So they have these ionic atmospheres and their charges are partially offset. So they're not as strong of positive and negative charge as they would normally be. So if we take that logic further um, and you follow this flow chart, if you have more ions in solution, so you have higher ionic strength, then you have more ions in that ionic atmosphere. And so you'll get a more um, significant partial negative charge around a cation, for example, which means that cation has less negative ch net charge, which means if you have less net charge, if you can't see that charge, there's going to be less attraction between ions and solution. Now, if they aren't attracted to each other, and then they don't crystallize or precipitate. Therefore, you end up having more dissolution because you have less precipitation. And what that means is ultimately, 
big star right here, higher solubility with a higher ionic strength. So here's another example. Um, in this case, what we're looking at is potassium hydrogen tartrate. And so that is this molecule right here. And it's just dissolving. And what you see here is the concentration of added substance, okay, where it's either magnesium sulfate, sodium chloride, glucose, or potassium chloride. And what effect that has on how soluble potassium hydrogen tartrate is. So the observations here are that the solubility increases, so it's going up, right, for both magnesium sulfate and sodium chloride. And that is an example of this increased solubility of the sparingly soluble salt when you have something else that is an inert salt present. But when glucose is added, there's no effect. And one has to consider why that is. The reason why is that glucose has no charge. It's a neutral molecule, and therefore it can't change the net charge if it diffuses into the ionic atmospheres. Now, KCl decreases the solubility of potassium hydrogen tartrate. And when you think about why that is, it's because it's the original thing that we're looking at is a potassium salt, right? And so potassium is a product of its dissolution. And so when you do have this common ion of adding more K plus from KCl, this is going to be the common ion effect, which is basically a certain form of Le Chatelier's principle. So if you're thinking about solubility and how it's going to change, you need to first look to see, is the substance being added charged, right? Is it a salt? Um, if it is, it can have an effect. If there's this common ion, then the Chatelier's principle is involved and things will become less soluble. If there's no common ion, we call it an inert salt, and therefore the solubility of the sparingly soluble salt will increase. All right, so I've referred to ionic strength, and it's worth defining this. It's a measure of the total amount of ions in solution, and the more highly charged an ion is, the more it's counted. There's a formula, which is this. So ionic strength is abbreviated mu. Right? So this is ionic strength right here. And it's equal to one half of the concentration of each species times its charge squared. Okay? You add that up for all of the species. So every single one um, is going to be its concentration times its charge squared. Add those all up, divide by two. We'll do an example. So what would the ionic strength be of 0 0.025 molar sodium sulfate? First, you think about how sodium sulfate dissolves to make two sodiums and one sulfate, and that means that it's going to make 2x of sodiums and 1x of sulfates, x being the amount of original stuff you have. You plug the numbers in for this particular example. So 2x would be two times the 0 0.025 that we had, making 0 0.05. And then we put it into our formula. So ionic strength is a half, right, times the concentration of sodium. And then sodium has the one plus charge, so one squared. Sulfate has the negative two charge, minus two squared. And we go forward, and that one squared becomes one. The minus two squared becomes four. And you put those concentrations in from here. And when you calculate that out, we find that the ionic strength is 0 0.075. And what you can notice here is that that is actually three times the original concentration of 0 0.025. There are some quick hints um, for these electrolytes. So something like sodium nitrate is called a one-to-one -one electrolyte, and its ionic strength is the same as its molarity. And so you see that here in our cheat chart. Sodium sulfate that we just did an example for is a two to one electrolyte. So it's two sodiums per one sulfate. That's where this terminology is coming from. And so its ionic strength, if you look at the thing here, molarity, ionic strength is three times the molarity. So if it helps you, you can memorize this kind of chart or you can always just go back to the formula. Now, there's also a caution worth making right now. You can only calculate ionic strength if it's a very dilute solution. The higher the ionic concentration is, the more likely it is that certain ions will come together and pair up and make complexes. And in that case, the calculations go out the window. Okay, so we've got the background of what happens when things are in a salty solution and what ionic strength is. And now we have to figure out how do we deal with the math of this and what 
is activity and what are activity coefficients. So activity is a big squiggly A for a particular analyte, right? So activity of C, C being the analyte. It is equal to the concentration, so the actual number of molecules per volume, times this thing called the activity coefficient. And the activity coefficient is abbreviated gamma. So what this is, is we replace concentration with activity to account for any kind of ionic strength effects. And the activity coefficient there, gamma, measures how much a particular um, situation is going to deviate from ideal behavior. And ideal behavior is, it's just the concentration. So our equilibrium constants that we're so used to that have been concentrations to the power of the coefficient. So what we used previously is down here. The real equilibrium constant doesn't use concentration, it uses activity. Okay. And since activity is concentration to times the activity coefficient, each one of these, if you look at say activity of C, is concentration of C to the C power and activity coefficient for C to the C power. So if we do an example in the middle there, you've got KSP of calcium sulfate, it is the activity of both of those products times each other. And that means it's the concentration times the activity coefficients. So every single equilibrium constant equation looks twice as complicated because you have to put in both concentration and activity coefficient. Yay. All right. Notice that the exponents on the activity coefficients are the same exponent as the concentration. So if we have the general form up top, you see that where there's to the power of C for both concentration of C and activity coefficient. Using a real example, if we have lanthanum sulfate that makes two lanthanums and three sulfates, the lanthanum concentration is squared and so is this activity coefficient. The sulfate is cubed and so is the sulfate activity coefficient. So you have to make sure you apply the same exponents to the activity coefficient as you do to concentration. Now, the magnitude of the activity coefficient, like how big is that number, depends on the ionic strength. And this dependence is going to be such that activity coefficients will be less than one. I'm going to explain to you why that is. So if we think back to a few minutes ago when I explained how calcium sulfate was more soluble if we had this second inert salt, and we think about how we have these equilibrium constants, and so this thing right here KSP is indeed a constant, which means it can't change. How is that possible, right? We know the observation is that concentration increases. Boom. Both the concentrations of calcium and sulfate increased. Well, in order for that to occur and to still equal a constant, that means these activity coefficients have to be smaller, right? They decrease. And that decreases there to offset the rise in concentration and allow this to mathematically still equal a constant. So if the ionic strength is low and we don't have very much of this additional salt added, we don't have much of an activity issue. And instead of being decreased, like those purple arrows, then we have things that approach a number one, meaning that all this stuff with activity coefficients, if those are all one, 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 then that collapses down to our good old fashioned normal concept of concentration equilibrium, um, or KC, the thing on the right there, which is what you're used to doing. So unless you have a really salty solution, everything you've been taught in Gen Chem and in my class up until this point is fair. If you have a fairly salty solution with ionic strength, then actually we should be considering activity. So that's why we're finally learning about this. So, all right, we know it depends on ionic strength. How do we calculate activity coefficients? I apologize for what looks like a sloppy slide. There is a formula in the box here. This is how you're going to calculate activity coefficients. Log of the activity coefficient depends on a few things. So the activity coefficient is what you want to get with this extended debye huckel equation. And it depends on ionic strength. So colors here, ionic strength is right there. And we've just learned 
about that formula. Okay, so you go back, figure out what the ionic strength is. It also depends on alpha, which is the size of the ion, and this is the hydrated radius. And that alpha shows up right here in the denominator. Um, by the way, I should point out that ionic strength is going to show up twice. Ionic strength is blue. So ionic strength shows up twice, both in the numerator and denominator. Okay, so it depends on ionic strength, it depends on ion size, which is more of an empirical fit than an actual physical measurement of ionic size. Then the other thing it depends on is the charge of the ion. Um, and Z is fairly commonly used in science as charge, so I didn't define it on the slide, but that is the charge of the ion. Okay, so three things charge, ionic strength, size. Those are the three factors that contribute to activity coefficient. Now, when you're using this formula, make sure you realize that on the left hand side it is a log of gamma, so you'll have to undo the log. Okay, so what's the trend? Um, there is a plot in the bottom left here that plots this Debye-Huckel equation and shows you as ionic strength increases, so we have increasing ionic strength, that the activity coefficient goes down. Okay. So that's the first thing. Increasing ionic strength causes a decreased activity coefficient. Right. So deviating from ideality means small, less than one number. But if you have a ionic strength near zero, then we have activity coefficient near one. Okay. Um, the other thing that we notice is the magnitude of the ion charge. And so if you have ions that have a plus or minus one, you're up here and plus or minus two, and then plus or minus three, plus or minus four. So the greater the magnitude of that charge is, the more the corrections for activity matter, the smaller the activity coefficient. The other thing that's not on here is that smaller ion sizes have more important activity effects. You'll see that in the table. So here's the table. The table is a little bit overwhelming. Try not to panic. It's divided by charge, and so you can see that you've got charge of plus or minus one, plus or minus two, three, and four. Things with a similar size, so here's the size column, are in rows together. And then all of this is various ionic strengths, and then like that right there is the activity coefficient for H plus, at an ionic strength of 0.001. So that's how you read this chart. And the trends that I just mentioned are all there. So within a charge category, so within charge of plus or minus one, as you decrease the ionic size, you're going to find that those numbers over here are getting increasingly smaller. So 0.964, for example, is smaller than 0.967. And it's more obvious at higher ionic strength. So 0.75 is a lot smaller than 0.83 when you've got that smaller radius. The next thing we notice is that as you go across a row and you're increasing ionic strength, you're also going to have a smaller activity coefficient further away from one, further from ideal. Lastly, if you look at the same size, so this is looking at 500 uh, picometers within the categories of two, three, and four charge, the higher the charge magnitude is, the smaller the activity coefficient and the bigger the influence is. So this small activity coefficient means a greater deviation from the ideal behavior. So, example of how to get the activity coefficient if we have a certain ion, zinc 2 plus, and a certain ionic strength of 0 0.083 molar. We have two choices. You can use the formula, or you can interpolate between the values on that table. So interpolation is all about the fact that the table has values of 0.05, um, and 0.1 ionic strength, but doesn't have exactly 0.083. So the first one is let's do the formula on top. You go to the table, you find that the size of zinc 2 plus is 600 picometers. So that's where we get alpha. Um, you're going to take this Debye Huckel equation on the right hand side, you're going to solve it, and that 600 picometers comes right here. Okay, that goes before the square root. The ionic strength shows up both on the bottom and the top, right? So here and here. The division by 305 is a constant. The minus 0.51 is a constant. And then because zinc is a 2 plus charge, you put the charge right there, 2. So that gets squared. When you put all that into your calculator, you come out with 0.4218. If you want to interpolate between values on the table down here, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, well, 
I know how big that gap is. How big is this gap um, as a fraction of that? So you're setting up a scaling factor. So the bottom here is the known parts, right? So that's the right-hand side there, um, where you've got on the right-hand side here, um, this is ionic strength, and over here is gamma, right? And we don't know the gamma of an ionic strength of 0 0.08. Fair enough. So you're basically saying, what's the range in ionic strength? What's the range in gamma? How far um, up the one range is the other one? And so it's just a scaling factor. We can do the math to collapse some numbers down, and we find that gamma then solves to be 0 0.4322. Whichever approach of these um, you prefer gives you still a very close answer, so 0.42 versus 0.43. All right. I mentioned earlier that glucose didn't alter the solubility of that compound, and that's because glucose is not charged. So any neutral molecule that's not ionic will have no ionic atmosphere because it has no charge. And so we can just let those activity coefficients be one because they don't have a charge dependence. So if it's neutral, activity is equal to concentration. That's cool. Also, you might be wondering about gases. Activity for gases is called fugacity, and activity coefficients for gases are therefore called fugacity coefficients. Um, remember that concentration is written in bars. If you have a small pressure, um, then you can say that the activity coefficient is about one, but ultimately activity for a gas is the actual pressure or concentration times its activity coefficient or fugacity coefficient. Another caveat is that if you have these very high ionic strengths, what will happen is that the trend of high ionic strength means small activity coefficient, which is the trend we see here in our red box, right? It says ionic strength increases, x-axis, activity coefficient decreases. That's only true at really low concentrations. If you get to a really concentrated salt solution, so greater than one molar, right? So this is one molar and up, what you find is activity coefficients actually increase. So that's the swoop right here. And that's because the salt starts being part of the solvent. And this is essentially a matrix effect. So when we're talking about activity and we're talking about ionic strength, we limit our attention to dilute aqueous solutions. And dilute, according to this graph, is about 0.1 molar or less, because that's where we have this trend that we can model. All right. OK, so you think you know what pH is. Let's revisit that concept. The formula for pH that we so often use is actually an approximation. So pH is approximately equal to negative log of H plus concentration. What it actually is, is it's equal to negative log of activity of the hydrogen ion. And that's what we see in the bottom equation. And because activity right here is equal to concentration times activity coefficient, we have to think about that. If we add a salt, we're increasing ionic strength which decreases activity coefficient, which changes pH, and it also happens to change H plus concentration. So let's do some examples, shall we? All right, what would the pH of water be if it just had 0.1 molar of KCl, just inert one-to-one -one salt? First thing is we figure out the ionic strength because it's a one-to-one -one salt, just K plus and Cl plus minus. Then we have an ionic strength of 0.1 molar. Okay, so right there, that's ionic strength equal to mu. We go to the table that I showed you earlier and we find the activity coefficients for H plus and OH minus. That's because we're talking about water and we remember that water happens to do this autoportalysis thing to create H plus and OH minus. So there's nothing else in this solution other than water and the 0.1 molar KCl. There's no other acid or base. Now because it's Kw, and Kw would normally be considered H plus times OH minus concentration. Well, you have to put in now those activity coefficients, okay? So this is the proper Kw formula, or equilibrium expression. So it's still making, if you're losing X waters, you're still making X H pluses and X OH minuses. And so you still plug in X for both of those, but you plug in also the values for activity coefficient um, that we just got off the table. Now what that means is that when we take Kw all on its own, which by the way is um, 
1 times 10 to the minus 14. Right? So there's an actual number that I'm not showing you. So when we take kW there, we have to divide it by these activity coefficients, um, multiply by each other, that ends up being x squared. And this leads to be x of 1.26 times 10 to the minus 7 molar H plus concentration. All right, so pH. Um, first of all, that's more H plus than normal. Okay, so we know that normally with no salt, that would be 1.00 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. Um, for pH, pH is negative log of activity. So the activity coefficient shows up again because we have to put this H plus concentration in right here. But you also have to put the activity coefficient. So it ends up being negative log of that concentration times the 0.83, which yields 6.98. So this water is actually slightly acidic due to the addition of this inert salt. Interesting. Let's do it again. So doing the example again, now we have 0.05 molar sodium chloride. I'll do this faster. You find the ionic strength. You go to the table. You get the two activity coefficients. You take your Kw equilibrium constant expression where you put those activity coefficients in, power of 1, and then x is going to be the unknown H plus and OH minus concentration. You solve that out. In this case, we get an x of 1.198 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. And then pH again is negative log of activity coefficient for H plus times H plus concentration, which we just got as X. 6.99, again, adding the salt has made this a slightly more acidic solution. All right, let's recap because we're about 26 minutes in, and I want to make sure you understand what we should have learned so far. So first things first, if you have an ionic compound dissolved in water, each ion has an ionic atmosphere that surrounds it. If you have other inert ions, so they don't have a reaction, they just interact, then what they do is they dissolve into a solution, they diffuse into the ionic atmosphere, and they change the net charge. So the apparent charge of that original ion in the center appears less. That then affects the solubility of that. So a high ionic strength increases the solubility because those ions don't see each other in solution and don't reprecipitate. The exception to this rule is if the salt you added shares a common ion with the sparingly soluble salt, then this is the common ion effect, which is the shot A's principle and solubility decreases. Okay. The deviation from ideal behavior, which we see here, is dealt with mathematically with activity coefficients. They depend on the ionic strength on the ionic size and the ionic charge. So the higher the strength, the smaller the ionic size, and the greater the charge, the more important the activity coefficient and deviation is. Activities, which is concentration times activity coefficient, really matter in equilibrium, and the pH that we're so fond of is actually negative log of activity, not just negative log of concentration. So activity ultimately is a description of how an ion behaves in solution considering all of the other ions in solution. Okay, the other thing that we're about to transition to is multiple equilibria. So we've observed that adding salt changes the H plus concentration because of ionic strength. We also know that when we add acids and bases to water, we now have multiple sources of H plus and OH minus. So the acid and base can contribute, but also water hydrolysis contributes. And we've dealt with that um, with acid-base chemistry separately from this topic. We've also dealt with the fact that polyprotic acids and bases can speciate into multiple forms of the polyprotic acid and base. And I alluded earlier to the idea that complex ion formation can happen. So multiple ions in solution can come together and not precipitate, but just be a more complex ion that's still floating around. So those have their own equilibrium constants. So ultimately, everything in the solution, the concentration of it, depends on all of these influences. It can get really complicated. Our calculations, if we want to do a correct calculation, should reflect all of the multiple equilibria, which leads us to the systematic treatment of equilibria. Now, pay attention definitely for part of this. The first part is the most important. When it gets to the end, I'm going to give you more of an example on how to work through this. So what is systematic treatment of equilibria? Well, it's a way to deal with every type of chemical equilibrium that you can think of. 
we set up some general equations, we put conditions or approximations on them, and then we use spreadsheets and substitutions to solve the complex map. Ultimately, the idea here is that you need to have the same number of equations as you have unknowns. If you have four unknowns, you better have four equations. That's math. If you have four equations with four unknowns, it's possible to solve the values of the unknowns. The unknowns here are the concentrations of every chemical species that you're interested in. So if we needed a certain number of equations, we have to go to the equilibrium constants, things like Ksp, Ka, Kw, but there are two more that I'm going to teach you about. One is called charge balance, and each solution has one charge balance equation. And there's also mass balance, and there could be multiple mass balance equations in effect. Charge balance basically states that the solution has to be neutral electrically. You can't have a net positive charge or a net negative charge. All the positive charges have to equal all the negative charges. Okay, so there has to be a neutral overall charge. Mathematically here then, you have the equal sign in the middle. On the left-hand side, you have all of the cations, C, and on the right-hand side, you have all of the anions, okay, and they've got coefficients in front of them. If we do an example, or again, I'm gonna point out the equal sign. On the left-hand side here, we have H plus and K plus, so this is for potassium phosphate. And on the right-hand side, you have OH minus, and then you have all of the different forms of phosphate. So these are the forms of phosphate that have charge, by the way. So H2PO4 minus two times HPO4 two minus. So that two right there, each of the HPO4 two minus has two negative charges. So you better multiply its concentration by two if you're counting charges. Same thing with phosphor, phosphate, three minus charge. Each one of those has three negative charges. So there's a coefficient of three times the concentration. Um, it might look at first glance like you have more things on the right hand side than you have on the left, but you need to remember that the concentration values themselves and the brackets are different. So here's an example of what the actual numbers are. So all of the blue things are the various negative ions and the gray is positive ions. You have a lot of potassium plus here, this large gray bar sticking out to the right. You have a lot of HPO4 two minus sticking out to the left and many of the other species have almost nothing at equilibrium. Okay, so the net bars on the one side equals the net bars on the other side. Overall, you have to recognize that activity coefficients don't appear in charge balance. It's just concentration. How many of the charged things do you have times their charge? All the negative on one side, all the positive on the other side. The coefficient is the charge in the ion. So I mentioned like the two negative charge from HPO4 two minus becomes a two coefficient. And also if you're in water, you have to include H plus and OH minus because they are charged species that are always there in water. Mass balance. Mass balance, like I said, there can be multiple forms. So it's saying the quantity of all species in solution of a particular atom or group of atoms equals the amount that you delivered. So you put it in, and then it might speciate, but all the species equal what you put in. So for example, with speciation, acetic acid, right? You can have the acetic acid form, or you can have the acetate form. So if I put in a certain amount of acetic acid, I make 0.05 molar acetic acid, then that concentration, the 0.05 molar, is equal to both types of it, the undissociated acid and the dissociated conjugate base. So that's an example for mass balance of acetic acid in water. Again, activity coefficients do not appear. Here's an example of another mass balance. Um, if that compound dissociates in multiple ways, we have to include all the products in the mass balance. So H3PO4, phosphoric acid. Let's just say we do 0.025 moles in one liter. So it's triprotic. We have multiple equilibria. We have a lot of forms of phosphoric acid. What that means is the total concentration, 0.025 moles per liter of molarity, is the sum of the fully acidic, both of the intermediates, and the fully basic PO4, 3 minus. Now notice in this case that because we're talking about mass, we're just saying where did all the phosphates go? We do include this neutral compound. Um, it's not charge balance. It doesn't matter if it's charge here. It's mass balance. Where did the molecules go? How many total molecules do we have? So it's basically the amount we put in, 0.025 equals all of the forms of phosphate. Um, if you've got multiple things going to the sample, but you know what you put in, then you can have multiple mass balance equations. 
So here we have, we want mass balance for K plus and for phosphate, so potassium and phosphate. If we mix 0.025 moles of KH2PO4 and 0.03 moles of KOH, and then diluted to a liter. So there's two sources of potassium, but potassium we know is gonna dissolve completely. And so there's not an equilibrium for potassium, there's just two sources. And so we add those two concentrations up. Okay, so that's one mass balance for potassium as a known concentration. For phosphate, it's just like the prior slide. All of the forms, of the different species of phosphate equal the 0.025 moles per liter that we're put in. So there's an example of a thing that has two mass balances. There's also the situation where you don't know the total concentration, but you know something about proportions. This happens with KSP problems a lot. So we want to write the mass balance if we have silver phosphate. So silver three and phosphate, one compound ion, makes one phosphate and three silvers. So because it makes one phosphate and three silvers, you have a silver concentration that's equal to three times the phosphate concentration, right? You get one X of these, You've got 3x of those in order to make 3x equal x. You better multiply the right-hand side, x by 3, right? So that's great, except phosphate participates in equilibrium, and phosphate can grab protons, and so you actually have to put the phosphate in these brackets, right? So that's a parenthesis right there. So the silver plus concentration is equal to 3 times the concentration of all of the forms of phosphate added together, um, and that's why the mass balance, the phosphate could go into these different species. All right, this is an example then where we don't know the total concentration, but we do know the relationships between the species in the solution because we know the stoichiometry of the original compound that they came from. All right, so getting on to systematic treatment of equilibrium then, it is a six-step process. The first process is to write the reactions that relate to it. If you're in water, it includes Kw. If something could possibly speciate, then it includes the Ka equations. Any other equilibrium that might relate um, is part of these reactions. Then you write the charge balance equation, and then step three is write the mass balance equations. Remember, there might be more than one. Step four is to write the equilibrium constant expressions for the reactions from step one. Step four is the only place where we include activity coefficients. Step five is to take a step back and to count equations and unknowns. You have to have the same number of equations as you have unknowns. If you don't, that means you haven't found all of the equilibrium reactions, or it means you need to set a value at a known value or make an assumption of something being super small compared to something else. Um, finally, step six is solve, and that's an iterative step. And the first thing you do is you put activity coefficients to one, basically ignoring them, and you get concentrations, and then you say, okay, based on these concentrations, I know my ionic strength, and now I can get activity coefficients, and you iterate that until it stops changing. All right, so those of you who think this sucks and aren't in my class can totally stop now. Those of you in my class should probably watch this example. And this example is going to be the ammonia example, and this example will be the rest of the video. So our task here is to get the concentration of all of the ionic species in an aqueous solution of 0.01 molar ammonia. So this is to walk you through the steps of systematic treatment of equilibria. Step one is write the reactions. The first thing is that ammonia is a base, and so it can abstract a proton from water and make ammonium, right? NH4 plus is ammonium. And you can go and you can look up the KB um, constant number for that. The second one is because it's water, you have Kw. So these are the two pertinent equations. And our goal then is to find the concentration of all um, of the ammonia, the ammonium, the OH minus, and the H plus. Okay. So next step, write the charge balance equation. All of the positive charges equal negative charges. There you have it. The next thing is mass balance. I know that we added 0.01 molar ammonia. I also know that the ammonia can become ammonium. And so those two concentrations together equal 0.01 molar. Recall that F, by the way, is formal concentration, and that is used if it's a species that dissociates, um, meaning this is the total concentration of the species. Now, step four is to write the equilibrium expressions for the reactions. So for your convenience, here are the reactions from step one, Kb and Kw. 
So we want the KB and KW equilibrium expressions, right? So products over reactants, and you need to include activity coefficients. So the products for KB are ammonia and OH minus, and so here you have ammonia with its activity coefficient, OH minus with its, over the reactant, which is ammonia, right? Um, and same concept for KW, which we've already seen. Remember that this is the only step in the six-step process where activity coefficients show up. Step five is to make sure you have the same number of unknowns as equations. So we had four unknowns of interest. And we do have four equations, charge balance, mass balance, the Kb for ammonia, and the Kw for water. So that's good. Four equations, four unknowns. Step six is to solve. We know it's possible, but how will we do it? Um, so our strategy is to first, like I said, start by putting activity coefficients to one. Then we pick a variable. Right, a variable is an unknown species. If it's an acid-based problem like this, H plus concentration is usually a good place to start. So that'll be the thing that we want to calculate is what is H plus concentration? Then we rearrange all of the equations. We make substitutions. We want to try to get one equation with one unknown, the unknown being H plus, because we just chose that. So how do we do that? Well, we have to target each equation to rearrange, and we're going to plug them into the fourth. So we look at the four equations we have, and we have to pick the one that we're not going to rearrange. And I recommend that you use the one that has the most unknown variables in it to not rearrange. And in this case, KB is the one that has the most variables. Charge balance has similar, but we'll go with KB. So once you've got your chosen equations that you are not going to rearrange, right? So we're not rearranging KB. I think you should make a table where you have each of the four unknowns, right? And H3, and H4+, plus, H+, plus, OH-, minus, and you list out which of these formulas they appear in, okay? So for example, H+, plus only appears in charge balance and in KW, right? So those are the only ones that you could use to get its number. Then what you do is, looking at the table, you pick which equation is going to be used for which species, and you can use each equation only once. Now we've already decided that KB is the target equation, so we better not rearrange that one or else we're doing something to it twice. So we cross it out, we stop considering it. With it crossed out then, what you see is that ammonia only has mass balance available. Right? So we're going to have to rearrange the mass balance equation to isolate ammonia. Okay? And now because we've used mass balance once, we can't use it for ammonium, ah, okay. which means now we have to use charge balance for ammonium. So here's charge balance. So circle, well, terrible, terrible circle um, for charge balance. All right, so charge balance is now out of the running for both of these, which leaves Kw for both H plus and OH minus. And for a moment, you might think that this is a problem, but remember, we're not bothering to rearrange anything for H plus because that's our ultimate variable we want. And so that leaves then that Kw will be used to find the OH minus concentration, right? So we don't rearrange anything for H plus and we do find that we're left with Kw for OH minus. So to summarize then, we're going to use mass balance to isolate ammonia, charge balance to isolate ammonium, and Kw to isolate OH minus. All of those are then going to be plugged into Kb, which we started with saying, hey, we want to solve Kb. Right, so let's do it. Kw for OH minus. You rearrange the equation, and we have OH minus equals Kw over H plus. Fine, that's good. Easy to do. Charge balance, we isolate ammonium and H4 plus on the left. Um, and then we plug in where we just established that OH minus is equal to Kw over H plus, that goes in for OH minus there. So you're starting to build these equations to have H plus as the main variable. The next rearrangement was to rearrange mass balance to get NH3 all on its own. And remember F there is the formal mass, so 0.01. Um, the thing that was yellow highlighted right here, so NH4, Plus, right? We just defined it as being that big yellow thing. 
So where MH4 plus appears, uh, we plug that in. Okay. So hopefully you're starting to see the idea of rearrange and substitute. The last one then, KB, is the one that we didn't rearrange anything to. And so what we have is where OH minus shows up, right? We're going to put in KW over H plus. Aha, cool. Where NH4 shows up, right? So NH4 plus, well, it shows up there. We plug in that whole thing of KW over H plus minus H plus right there. And likewise, where we have NH3 on the bottom here, we plug in that whole mass, which goes down there. And again, the F value is 0 0.01. So you now have you now have one equation with one unknown. Okay, so this right here is the equation where you know that number for KB, you know that number for F. You know the number for KW, and therefore the only unknown there is H plus. Okay, one equation, one unknown. You're probably looking at this and thinking, what? Really? So it's horrible, but it is solvable. So how do you solve it? Well, you're going to do it through iterations, right? So first you guess an H plus value and you see if it produces the KB. Right? So we know the KB value. We plug in an H plus on the right hand side and we say, hey, did we get it right? Oh, uh, no? Okay, we'll make it a smaller H plus. Did we get closer? Make it a larger H plus. Did we get closer? So it's many guesses and ultimately you'll get it right. You can do this in Microsoft Excel. It has solver and goal seek functions, depending on what version you're using. And that'll help you find and say, hey, I want this formula on the right to equal KB. Do it. So I can. Then what you do is you go back to the last slide. So once you know H plus, the former slide was a bunch of equations that gave you a H minus as a function of H plus, and H4 as a function of H plus, and H3 as a function of H plus. That lets you get the numbers for those. Ah, okay, pretty cool. But what about activities? Yeah, so we just assumed that they were one, which meant that they didn't matter, and the whole first part of the video was telling you they exist, so they kind of matter. Um, but we assumed they were one, we calculated the concentrations of everything with that assumption. Now with that concentration, we have an estimate of how much uh, H plus and H4 plus and OH minus there are. These are the ions which lets you calculate the ionic strength, which lets you get activity coefficients. Now you go back to the KB formula, but you actually include activity coefficients. And so what was already a complex equation will be complexified even more. Yeah, I just made that word up right here by adding those in. Um, and then what you do is you solve again. So it's the same process, right? We've just added constants. And on the right hand side, so you plug them in next to the different values, right? And you're going to solve again. It's going to give you a new H plus concentration, <clears throat> which gives you a new concentration of the other things, which gives you a new ionic strength. And after several iterations, so you do steps three through five, right? It'll give you new concentrations, new ionic strength, new activity coefficient, calculate again. You're going to do it over and over again until the step the answer stops changing. And that is called an iterative process. And you're looking for the values to converge on one value that stops changing. So if it sounds complicated, it kind of is. Um, but it's not unachievable, right? You're smart people. If you have this goal in front of you, you can figure it out. And hopefully this video helps. So as far as figuring it out, those of you who are in my class, here is a practice question. So we have magnesium carbonate. It has a KSP value. Um, the carbonate ion, of course, forms bicarbonate and carbonic acid. Um, and so you have the Ka1 and 2 for carbonic acid. And what I want to know is if we have a solution with a pH of 7.5, right? So hint, you know H plus concentration. What is the solubility of magnesium carbonate? So if you're interested in doing this and you're in my class, you can go find the solution posted on Canvas and see if you're right. All right. Thank you for watching. Bye.